If I'm saved by God's grace, why should I be concerned about my works? Stay with us as we let the Bible answer that question. Greetings, dear friends. My name is Marvin Clark. And I'm Judy Clark. And together, we're going to look at a subject that I think you're going to enjoy. And that subject is Christian behavior. Christian behavior. When we talk about Christian behavior, uh, probably, I think I'm safe in saying, Judy, that the average person, when they hear that term, they might have a little bit of fear they might have a little bit of concern because when we talk about behavior in the Christian life, none of us feels like we match up. That's true. But I have good news. The Bible has good news. We all match up if we're in Christ and He is in us. So hang on. There's good stuff ahead. There's a verse that I'd like to start with. It's 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. This is a beautiful verse. It, I, I like to call this verse a double barrel verse. The gospel is a double barrel gospel. There's two things involved, and this verse sums it up so well. This is the one that says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us our sins. And then there's a comma because there's another thought coming. Most of us like to stop right there. We like the idea of being forgiven. And we are. We start with a clean slate when Jesus comes into our life. But there's another aspect of the gospel. And that is, and he's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now again, we all like the idea of a, a forgiving God, a God that justifies us. We're not so sure, though, about a God who wants to cleanse us and make us like Him in character. But that's equally good news. They go together. And don't let it uh, bring any fear into your life at all. God gives us justification, which means forgiveness. He also gives us sanctification, which means cleansing. So He is both our Lord and our Savior. We all like the Savior part of Jesus, but remember, he is Lord of our life as well. And that's where obedience comes in. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and on, let me share this with you from the words of Paul. Paul says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And that's the sanctification process. That's the cleansing process. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul says we're dead to the things of this world, or we should be. That's where we're headed. And then when Christ, verse 4, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with Him in glory. So, verse 5, Colossians 3, verse 5. The first word is interesting. It says mortify. That means kill. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And now he lists those things that he wants us to mortify or kill. Here they are. He wants you to kill fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, and idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which we also walked some time back. Yes, we did, when we lived in those things. But now, things are different. Now, we also put off all of these things, like anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication. He says, put them out of your mouth. And don't lie to one another seeing that you've put off the old man or the old woman with all of his deeds or her deeds. Now you've put on the new man or the new woman, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created us. Tall challenge. It could even be scary unless you realize 
how powerful God is and how the Holy Spirit can do all of these things in us and for us if we let him. Judy, you've got a verse here. I think you've already turned to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now, if you think you heard some heavy stuff so far, listen to this verse that Judy is going to read. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's a, it's a pretty high calling. I mean, it's a very high calling. And, and you're never going to do it. And Judy's never going to do it. And I'm never going to do it. Only by the grace of God can we come anywhere near that. Perfecting holiness in the fear or respect of God. But that's our goal. And let's don't ever say we can't achieve it. By His grace, it can happen. And by the grace of God, it will happen. Remember that? popular saying that used to be let go and let God. I've heard that. And that makes sense here because this can seem so overwhelming that some people may say, oh, I don't even know where to start oh, yeah. because I know me and I know how I am. There's no way I'll achieve that ideal. And that's true. We can't. It's only with God in us can that occur. And thank you to the God of the universe who only lays on us one thing at a time. Because if we got hit with all the things that we were doing wrong, whew. it would overwhelm us and we would give up. We would throw in the towel. But like you said, he just shares one new thing here and one new thing there. And by his grace, because we love him, we say, OK, take it away. I don't want that anymore. Uh, OK, that one, too. Take it away. I don't want it anymore. I want you instead. So most of us will die before that happens where we perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. We may die first. That's okay. It doesn't matter. He's taking us on a journey, and however far we get in that journey on this earth is okay. He looks at where we're headed, the direction we're headed, not the fact that we've achieved the very end of the uh, perfection process. Neat verse in 2 Corinthians 5, it, it talks about ambassadors ambassadors for Christ. Check this out. Paul says, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and he's given to us, to Judy and to me and to you, dear ones, the ministry of reconciliation. What is that that we share with other people as ambassadors for Christ? That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And listen to this good news not imputing their transgressions unto them, and he's committed unto us. He's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, he calls us ambassadors. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. God's been reconciled to us. He's forgiven us. Now, he wants us to be reconciled with God, to realize that he's accepted us and there's nothing between, that we are abiding in him and he's abiding in us. So what is an ambassador? Right, what's an ambassador? This is a good one to teach your children and to, to uh, remind our viewers. An ambassador is someone that goes to another place to represent the place from which he came. Our country, our fantastic wonderful country, the United States of America, sends ambassadors to pretty much every nation on this uh, planet. And those dear people that go as ambassadors are representing this country. So when a person over in India sees an ambassador from the United States come to India, they can look at that ambassador and say, aha, that's what Americans are like because I see in this person that he does this and he has this habit and this kind of a lifestyle. So he's representing people from that country and how important it is as Christian ambassadors to represent the country from which we came and that's heaven. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens in heaven. 
We are citizens of heaven, the Bible says. So when we go out and meet people, we are ambassadors representing the place from where we came, and that is God's kingdom of heaven. What a responsibility, what a joy, what a privilege. So if we're saved because of what Jesus has done, and we are, we don't have any part of that. Salvation is 100% Jesus. He has done it, and that's how we have it. So if we're saved because of what Jesus has done, and not because of what we do, why do we be concerned about doing good things? Well, because we're ambassadors for Christ. They look at us and they see what God is like. We're representatives of the God of the universe. When people look at us, they should see Jesus and know what Jesus is like and say, hey, if that's what Jesus is like, I want him because I see him in you. Tall challenge. It is. But that's God's plan. Let's take a look at some specific areas, areas of life that God would have us attend to as his ambassadors. The subject again today is Christian behavior. We're going to look at dress. We're going to look at diet. We're going to look at entertainment. And we're going to look at how to deal with uh, unpleasant people, people that are not the easiest to get along with. Judy, let's start with dress. And I think you've already turned to it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. God is asking uh, the women, and men can certainly be, be uh, in this as well, but he's asking specifically women here to dress modestly. In the King James, it used the word modest. Ladies, dress modestly. And it mentioned the, the braiding of hair. And that's not just braiding hair. That's okay to do that. But they were putting strips of gold and strips of silver within the braid. And the only reason that somebody would do that is to say, hey, look at me. You know, look at me. Well, God doesn't want us to dress in such a way or even act in such a way that we're calling attention to ourselves. He wants us to dress and act in such a way that it would direct people's attention to him and to his father. So he says, ladies, dress modest, modestly. And I think that's what's so appropriate, what you just said, Marvin, is that when women are approached with this, it's so easy to become defensive. You know, who are you to tell me how to dress? Yeah. You know, and why would God be concerned how I dress? You know, I need freedom of choice and expression. God doesn't take away our freedom. He doesn't take away the freedom of choice. But the more we love him, the more we want to reflect him. And by doing that, we understand where that middle ground is, where the attention isn't about us and how we are perceived, but it's more about whom we represent. Mm. And that is the message that we portray. And that only comes as we grow in him. And he, through the Holy Spirit, helps give us the peace in our dress to know when we feel comfortable and happy and feel beautiful and feel like we can exemplify the God whom we love and serve. And it doesn't become about showing or showcasing ourselves to gain attention. It w well said. Uh, in fact, better than I could say it because I was tempted when I knew what the subject was today to get into some specifics. And I'll just barely get into uh, not even specifics. It would be very easy for me to do that because as a man, Judy, as you well know, you've lived with, lived with this guy for uh, 35 years, I guess it's been now. So as a man, uh, you know, and many of our viewers already know, that, that men, how can I say it without just saying it this way, men are turned on by what they see. All right? We are visual we're turned on by what we see. Women are turned on by what they experience. So, when any man sees a, a woman that is dressed 
I'll just say provocatively, uh, it is a real challenge for that Christian man to keep his mind centered and focused on spiritual things. Are you with me? Yes, I am. Okay. But I also understand, too, that sometimes women are craving that attention because they don't get it um, in any other way, and so they feel that that is necessary. When we find peace and connection with Christ first, then that healing process happens in such a way that we don't need to dress in a way that gains an attention that we're really not craving. And so it's, it's a step-by-step -step process, this Christian walk. And it, it infiltrates all areas of our life. And I believe that's what we're trying to say here, is that as you grow in Christ through his Holy Spirit, these things all get worked out in our lives if we put him first. And that's where we need to be. And that will cover the need that may occur in the sense that you've got to dress in a certain way to gain the attention you feel so hungry for. Mm. And then when you get it, it's like, no, that's not what I wanted. What are you thinking, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, miscommunications occur and whatever. And so it's a, it's a tough line, and especially when you're raising teenage children. You have a teenage daughter, and, and you know, the dads want to protect the daughter, and the moms are in between trying to help balance mm -hmm. how the child should dress. And so it becomes quite a heated thing. And the peer pressure gets in there. It does. And it's where our focus is. Magazines, TV, others, where is our focus? And that is such an influential um, way to steer us in an out of balance form or fashion is that if we stay in God's word, we'll find the balance. Okay. But if we go to the outside, then we start swerving out of balance. Thank you for softening the blow there. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I needed that. I, again, uh, I did say men are turned on by what they see. We are visual, that's true. Women are turned on by what they experience. When I am nice to Judy and uh, respect her and open the car door for her and bring her flowers and do the dishes when they're stacked up in the kitchen, these things uh, a female would respond to. So men and women are different, and Judy just uh, expressed it so well there in a nice, positive uh, way that uh, kept me out of trouble. <laughs> All right. <laughs> By the way, Judy, I, I have friends that will not even go to the beach during the summertime because they want to keep their mind on Jesus. And maybe I don't need to say any more about that. Our viewers probably understand what I'm saying. All right. Let's leave dress while I'm still in one piece and go to diet. All right. Here we go to diet. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. Here's what he says. What? Question mark. What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? <laughs> we don't belong to ourselves. Somebody redeemed us. Somebody bought us back. We don't belong to ourselves because we were bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. We were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, not our own. We belong to Him. So, uh, garbage in, garbage out. Junk food in, Junkie out. There's a very close connection, a huge close connection between the physical and mental and spiritual elements of our being. Those three things are so closely connected. When one is out of whack or out of balance, the other two are not functioning in balance either. That's why it's important to uh, take care of our physical well-being because it affects our mental well-being and our spiritual well-being as well. Now, <laughs> remember back, Judy, we were first married, and we had a guest coming over to our house. I, I refer to the guest as kind of a hippie. Uh, she dressed like a hippie and spoke like a hippie and just was kind of the, 
uh, the hippie kind of a person back in the 70s. And, and sure enough, we had her come over as a guest, and she was extremely into healthful living. So bad that, what, what did she do to you when she walked in the house? Oh, gave me a whole list of, of uh, a checklist of items that if it was in the food, was there milk, egg, cheese, uh, salt, um, sodium, glute, I mean, all kinds of stuff. And I, I just stood there shocked. I bet. Because it was like, uh, I don't know. Sugar, MSG, yes. preservatives, pepper, and saccharin. And that's just a few of the ones I remembered. <laughs> and she was asking you, was any of that in the food that you, pre you prepared for the supper? And I wanted to leave. I bet. You couldn't I was wait just to get out of there. newly a brand new bride and a cook. Right. And then I meet up with this, and I was feeling very intimidated because I, I wanted to, of course, you know, be and feel successful as a cook and presenting to a guest. Yeah. And then I felt like, oh, the wind <laughs> was knocked out. I guess it was. So after we had that long list of, of no-nos, and realizing that there was probably some of those no-nos no in the supper that you had prepared, I said, what in the world do we do? How do we handle the situation? She was a relative. She was a, like a, a cousin of mine. And I finally said, the only thing I can do, the only thing I know how to do to get through this awkward situation is to go down to the store, and I did, and I bought a bunch of fresh fruit. I brought that fresh fruit back, and we cut it up, put it in little chunks, and made a fruit salad. And we all had fruit salad. And we put one in front of your plate, one in front of uh, my place. And then we gave her one. And she looked at it <laughs> and said, hang on to your seats. She looked at it and said, is this organic? <laughs> God help me. Help me to keep my Christian experience. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when we came up with the line. When you pray and ask God to bless the food, yeah. let him bless it. Amen. Good way to say it. Now, for families who wish to transition, Judy, and, and any Christian should be wanting to transition into God's health program. Yes. And, and they've had, uh, prior to the time that they're trying to get more healthy, they've had a lot of junk food, and the kids have pretty much eaten when they wanted and whatever they wanted. But now they see the, the urgency of, of eating healthfully so they can have a clear mind and make good choices. Uh, how might a family deal with children who still want to eat the stuff that tastes good and is not good for you when mom and dad or grandma and grandpa want to get on a more healthy diet? You have to make food fun, colorful, eye-appealing, and you need to engage them in it. The more they have hands on, the more they will try the food. Because if, if they're not involved and they don't fully understand, they'll look at it and, oh, this does not look very good. But we used to have fun by putting names with the food, too. On uh, our church day, we used to love to have a great big fancy meal. And in it, we would label and name things according to the Bible so that it would entice them to try it, like broccoli at a young age. And we called it Zacchaeus's trees. And so when you see Zacchaeus's trees, it became, oh, well, we just studied that. So I'll taste and see what his tree was like. Neat. And that was at a very young age. But as they get older, engage them in helping with the menu planning and say, what kind of fruit could we have? What kind of vegetable could we have tonight? Can you help me select it? And uh, encourage them to go with you to pick out the produce and then also in helping to prepare it. Outstanding. I hope you listened carefully to that. That is a way to bring your children along with you or your grandchildren along with you as you transition into a more healthful diet. And they also watch our faces to see how we like something because I know at school, plus I know with grandchildren and with our, our own family, that they look to see what kind of face we're going to have or if we're going to skip it but yet make them eat it, they know in a moment yeah. that you're trying to yeah. fool them with yeah. something. So 
how we carry ourselves and present ourselves in that food. I know many a time I've gone and taken a bite and said, oh, this is the best eating thing ever. <laughs> you know, and you're thinking, this is wonderful. You guys, this tastes so good. You're missing out if you don't try it. Oh, that's okay. I'll eat yours. Well, you know what that does. They want to get involved, and then they'll take a taste to see there if you what go. you're saying is true. Little trick there. Good for you. Let's jump to entertainment. Boy, this is a wide field, and to zero in on what is healthy entertainment and what is not is a real challenge. But 2 Corinthians 3.18 essentially says, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, by beholding you become changed. So when I talk to youth groups and tell the kids, if you guys are watching the shoot 'em ups on television and you're playing those violent video games, guess what? That's what you will eventually become. Because what you see, what you hear, what you touch, what you experience is what you are or soon will be. So, be careful what you see, be careful what you do. The last one we want to look at is how to deal with not so nice people. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as liveth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay, saith the Lord. So, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. <laughs> if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. And don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know what those coals of fire on the person's head is? No. It's guilt. Mm. You'll make them feel guilty because you didn't treat them like they treated you. You were nice when they were mean. So when I get yelled at and ripped apart by someone, I don't try to defend myself. I let my character defend me. All right? You've heard that it's been said, you'll love your neighbor and you'll hate your enemy. But I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for those people that despitefully use you and persecute you. This is all, dear people, in the Bible.